All right, everybody, I'm joined here with Vamsi Krishna, uh, interventional cardiologist and uh, peripheral vascular expert and, uh, and complex PCI expert down in Texas. Uh, I'm going to show you a case, Vamsi. I'm just going to know what you think about this. I don't normally look at echoes, uh, I'll be quite frank. I mean, I do, but I don't. But in the cases <laughs> of uh, pulmonary embolisms, I have to, so I'm kind of stuck. This is a guy, he's in his mid-60s. He's actually kind of interesting because he can hike and do some pretty interesting stuff and some fun stuff. Um, but he has this unique problem, and I'll show you uh, in a minute on his uh, CT scan what that unique problem is. Um, but, you know, he comes in, he's hypoxic, but they um, mm -hmm. they don't know exactly why. So they start getting this echo, and you can see he's yeah. got a real problem. Right. Right. You can clearly see the RVs dilated. And, you know, he's got septal bounce and, and, and a small little pericardial fusion. Yeah. And so they say, okay, well, you know, maybe he has more than the problem that we thought. So I'm going to get to that real quick for you. Um, one second. So I got to open that. And essentially, uh, we look into the, the care everywhere that ever, you know, the, the sort of how you figure out how anything's happening anymore. For anybody, we look into the care everywhere. Turns out he's got uh, a cryptogenic organizing pneumonia in like I don't know, 2014 or something. Last saw his pulmonologist maybe a year or two ago uh, for his interstitial lung disease. Has um, an echo from 2018 that looked like it was relatively normal. Had very moderately elevated uh, right ventricular filling pressures and sort of maybe a mildly dilated RV by the report. We can't actually see the images, of course. Um, and he tells us when he's talking to the ER doctor, you know, two weeks ago, I could walk around, kind of do whatever I want. Um, I could, I went on a hike. He told mm -hmm. us he went on a hike um, with his family for like the Christmas season or whatever. Um, and so we're thinking, well, I mean, his, when I show you this CT scan, you're going to wonder because he's hypoxic and he's got, you know, one of those high flow non rebreather things on, um, and his high flow non rebreather thing is, uh, you know, whatever atrocious liters per minute they've set it to, and he's doing okay. He's, he's sat in okay, but, um, his lactate is like three or maybe it's 3.5. But he's not hypotensive per se. His blood pressure is like 90, but it's not normal, right? And at right. You look chart, you don't have a lot of other blood pressures. It's like 120 or something at some other time. And uh, Chris, his troponins are elevated as well? Yeah, his troponins elevated. It's like almost one, which is, you know, right. not normal. And so they get this CT scan I'm going to show you. If I can get it over there. I mean, I think that's kind of what I tell people. If, if you have a troponin more than 0.1, a small pericardial fusion and RV that's dilated like this with evidence of RV failure and high pump, chronic pulmonary hypertension, you know, you get really concerned about uh, not only about a PE, but also with CTE in there as well. Exactly. And so I think you can see this, right? Yep. Let me see if it'll let me scroll it. Let me window it for you. Let me go to two. There you go. Here's your window. For I, I look at things for arteries because I'm an yeah. artery. So. Mm -hmm. Right. So, you know, I look at this picture and I'm like, well, his lung. <laughs> his right lung is junk. Junk. Like, this is, not, <laughs> this is not working. He's got um this clot here, right? Yeah. And here. No, it's, you know, right. it, 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 it's, it's hard because I tell the ICU doctor who's, you know, we're doing this with our PERT team. I said, look. That's a lot of clot, but it also goes to a lung that doesn't really work. And this lung has a lot of presumably, you know, hypoxic vasoconstriction anyway, because the lung is so bad. But you're telling me that his echo a couple of years ago was normal, and this guy went on a hike, and now he's on a high flow non rebreather, and his lactate's abnormal. So, right. you know, I, I think we got to do something. Um, the question is, is how do I do it? Because, you know, he isn't well. And we have strongly sort of got away from, if at all possible, giving people lytics. And, you know, he kind of technically meets the category of massive pulmonary embolism because he technically, you know, he's in shock, his lactate is elevated, his RV looks quite poor. Um, but we've done what we can to not 
uh, give people Linux. We've just had such a bad experience um, with, uh, you know, in general, uh, with the, the brain bleeds with the Linux that we just, it's just, it's really hard, you know. Hey, Chris, on that, can but you show me your experience with that is? But. Yeah, Linux, not great unless, you know, obviously you're in PA arrest or you're in absolute shock where you can't even get the picture in there. Um, but, you know, I think also what's interesting that you showed is also how dilated that RV was, you know, on on, on your CT. Um, also kind of dictates that Linux are probably not going to be an effective tool um, yeah. when it's already so dilated. Right. So I guess the my question to you is, and so we made something up here a little bit. We and I I made the I coined this term, or at least I think I coined this term. So I'm going to take credit for it, even if sure. nobody else actually coined this term. I, we decided this will be the third person we've done this for. Um, uh, we we did what I call protected thrombectomy. So <laughs> what I did was I said, well, there's no you know saddle, and even in the people that have had a saddle, actually this has gone well and it hasn't been a problem. But I actually upfront put an RP impeller in. And I said, well, if he's going to crump, it's going to be when my big catheter goes across there, because that's when all my other patients who have ever had a problem have crumped. Um, you know, if, if I move the clot or I dislodge it and it becomes so occlusive that, you know, I can't get anywhere, whatever it might be. And I don't know what your practice is, but all I have here is one picture because one is grand and wasn't normal um, because he was in shock. But two. Right. Well, I only take a picture after. I used to take a picture before, but with the CT scan, we're so focused and we know where we want to go. I just go and take the clot out as fast as humanly possible. And then, you know, get my, my whole thing is time across that, that valve. I try and minimize it to the best. Thing. Exactly. Yeah. So, I don't take pictures anymore either. I just, I just suck. I, I suck. I usually do two sucks. And then if I'm not getting anything, then I take a photo, you know, exact same thing. If I'm, if I can't figure out why I'm not on the clot, I'll take right. a picture. But, so this is his pulmonary angiogram after we remove that big piece of clot and he, you know you can see there's a huge amount of pruning to that the base of that lung which is, right even on x even on digitally surfacted imaging is a giant honeycomb that's all shriveled up but the rest of the lung is perfusing now which is important i think and interestingly we were able to wean this rp impella in the room and um hemodynamically he did really well uh, in the sense that the RP really carried the carried the day, but um, I for some reason the tracing isn't downloaded here. I'm going to try and get it for you. But he so, did really poorly when we put that catheter across his pulmonary valve. He really did not like it. Uh, so Chris, a co couple questions for you. One is you did the RP impella from the neck, correct? Correct. I did it and, first from the neck. Okay. So uh, I think that's important for the audience to know. So it's a great way to, I think, utilize, um, you know, access points because you're using the large bore from the right femoral vein is what I'm assuming, correct? Yeah. Uh, and so then now, now you have, you know, uh, ease of access from the neck, uh, which is, I think is a great way to utilize it. And then what were the PA pressures when you, when yeah, you checked that's it? Perfect. So, you know, I'm going to show them to you here. I'm going to bring the report over, hopefully. So you can see that where we started was PA pressure in the 60s and where we ended was the PA pressure down below the 50s. Um, so, you know, for him, for him, we think that that's a, we know that's a dramatic improvement in the sense that, you know, he got better. We actually for, didn't capture it, but when you wean the RP and pillow, the PA pressures actually go down a little bit more because there's a little bit less flow, of course. Um, and they come actually into the mid 40s. He was able to go back to the ICU on the high flow nasal cannula that was weaned uh, into the evening, you know, 8 p.m. or something. And right. then he's actually transferred to the floor um, and left the hospital the following day. Uh, that's so that's fantastic. A, an abnormal lactate and a pulmonary fibrosis patient. Uh, maybe actually that's a lie. He left the next morning after that. We, we gave him one night to, to be normal. But from an abnormal lactate to a normal lactate, um, all in the course of, you know, essentially and, and, four plus and, hours. And in uh, terms of the thrombectomy catheter, which, do you, is, uh, which device do you use? We use a NARI here. Uh, we obviously, we have the large penumbra catheter. Um, yeah. But um, when we were building this program from a, the thrombectomy standpoint, uh, I have had a lot of experience uh, doing pulmonary embolism, but our, and so did one of our other partners, but most of the group had not. And so we yeah. wanted to be consistent and um, with both our teaching my, our partners how to, how to do this procedure, 
um, as well as for our lab staff to kind of be able to understand the setup proficient. and do things. And so we right. just chose a catheter to start with. We use the penumbra catheter, myself and some, two of my other colleagues, for other things and for this if we want to. Um, but our other partners are all kind of, they all kind of stick with the Inari because that's what they they know. And it works well for us. The blood saving pro, uh, uh, part yeah. of the through. The filter we to like, give back the blood, like yeah. That. I, I think the 24 French uh, Inari, just in terms of just pure suction power, is pretty pretty significant, especially it's pretty for amazing. And it's pretty amazing, know. especially even for chronic clot. It, it really can right. get. And, uh, you know, you know? This clot, it was pretty hard. It clearly. Yeah, I I, it, I, I was going to assume there's going to be some chronicity to it. You know, yeah. it, I don't think it, with this PA pressures being 60. Uh, you know, when I teach people about PEs, I'm like, this is a long-standing pulmonary hypertension patient that probably has acute on chronic mixed with pneumonia and now PE. So like you said, the support for this patient is probably going to be critical because his pressures are so high with the RV that's almost blown. And then and then on top of it, how do you actually get the clot out? Uh, yeah. TPA would not work on this patient. If you try to drip this patient, it would not, you know, it, that's why ECOS, you know, there's a recent study that came out um, where they did you know, ECOS versus uh, Inari and Inari won out, you know. Um, and, and the point on this is that clot, when it's acute, is excellent to lice. But after six hours, you form start to form collagen and chronicity to it that makes it really challenging to grab. And that, so far, the only device I've found to be really effective for chronic is, you know, getting your 24 French and sometimes putting a 20 or 16 right on top of it and then sucking it and then lollipopping it through uh, the sheath. You know, uh, I'm not sure what your experience has been. Sometimes these things are really hard to get out. Yeah, I think that's a good technical point for people. Uh, you know, I think everybody should listen to what Vancey says about pretty much anything that's venous thromboembolism, frankly. But this is probably one of the better things that Vancey taught me, which is, you know, you can grab onto these old chronic clots. This is what he means by lollipop. And you can actually hold on to them. Obviously, then it looks like a lollipop because there's like a ball of clot on the end of a stick. Uh, and then you can re unsheathe that into the sheath. And sometimes you can have to take the sheath out of the body over the wire and uh, replace all of the equipment, but you can get huge pieces of clot in single pieces. And I think what's really important about that, that Bansi taught me is it gets the central clot, but that also is like entangled in the distal stuff. And so when people are like, oh, well, the catheter is so big, how are you getting the distal clot out? It's like, well, if you look at this picture, there is no distal clot because it was all connected as one collagenous, you know, connective mess. And as long as I don't disrupt it too much, if I can s suck onto the main part of it, I can kind of pull the rest of it like little strings with me um, and take the, you know, essentially all of it out at once. Uh, and I think that's really uh, been a technique that we've utilized that has worked really well for our patients. So I just wanted to show you this and sort of see what you thought, Nancy, because, you know, we've done this three times now where patients have been in shock. We were really sort of not interested in, in lysis, somewhat anecdotally, um, in that we've had several people have a brain bleed and then somewhat right. not anecdotally, as you mentioned, which is such that we just, we're not getting, these people have chronic clot. A lot of this clot yeah. legs is right. It, or most of it has been there for more than a short period of time, certainly more than six hours. And then it flew away. And yeah, it might have some new clot connected to it, but a lot of it is not something that the lytic is going to address. And so we just think that mechanical removal works. And obviously in this anecdotal case, it worked well for this patient. Um, right. I mean, I think, Chris, I think something you did really well is that you know this is a complicated patient. And so you know that there's multi things going on. You know, the, his right lung was completely junk. His RV is dilated. His PA pressures are up. His RV is not functional. And so I think what was smart was the idea of being like, hey, we already know we're behind the eight ball. And so the goal is, hey, let's put like your protected thromboembolism, like coin term is actually very smart. You you already know you're down three touchdowns. And so rather than thinking that, you know, rather than just going there and not having a game plan, I think what the audience here should learn is that we're, lactate's up, you're hypotensive, you barely, the patient's barely um, already maxed out on oxygen. So your window, uh, once you put a large bore catheter across the pulmonic valve, if, uh, you know, and, and the PA pressure is already elevated, you can really crump. So I think two things really important for people to know, I think using support that, that Chris has shown beautifully from the neck is a, a, is a very easy and less than three minutes setup to do uh, and, and worth the time. And then number two is please don't use sedation. 
on these cases. You know, yes. when patients get versed said, uh, when they have PE, they, they die. Uh, and yeah. I tell everyone, please, 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 uh, you know, it's really quick to do these cases and minimize your anxiolytic, uh, yeah, especially we don't use any sedation in our pulmonary embolism program here. Um, uh, we were able to talk with our anesthesia colleagues and, you know, point out to them that, look, the way people die is exactly what Vamsi said. They lose their adenergic drive, they're already on the borderline. Yeah. And when you sedate them, that adrenergic tone goes down and things go really poorly for them. And we also do not intubate these people, of course. Um, right. We do everything we can to not intubate these patients. It's it, those is also that's also how people die. Um, and our anesthesia colleagues are great about it, and they provide. We don't, you know, they're not in all of our cases, but in this case, of course, there was one, and they provided all the oxygenation that they could while we worked, and we used twenty five a lidocaine or something, so this guy wouldn't be uncomfortable. <laughs> And that's okay, you know, 12 and 10 and 10 or 12 and 12 or whatever it is. Um, but, uh, and, you know, he didn't really have any discomfort. I actually saw him yesterday or the day before or something in clinic. He's doing great. He went on a hike last week. He feels fine. He's going to be on lifelong anticoagulation. Uh, you know, obviously he can't tolerate another pulmonary embolism given his other problems. But um, so, but he, he's doing well. And, you know, we're just happy that we were able to kind of, like you said, think through this and kind of a, a, apply some hemodynamic thoughtfulness. Yeah. And, you know, we engaged our advanced heart failure team on this case as well to try and talk to them through the, you know, what we were thinking. And I think if you have those people or even just a good general colleague or another smart interventionalist on your team, um, it's always smart to to talk with somebody else uh, about what you think you're going to do because you might not have thought of everything. I certainly don't. And if you don't have that, call Vamsi or me or <laughs> Uh, and we'll talk it through with you, uh, anybody on armor, really, um, because that's what it's about. So thanks, man. I appreciate you looking at this case with me. I kind of want of, to. Of course. Hey, hey congratulations. It's great work. Awesome. You know, I, I think I think you're 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 strat I think you had a strategy and it clearly helped this patient. And I, I think, you know, to your point, just anything we do, complex PCI, CLI, PAD, Venus, it's, it's all about the, 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 the patient. Patients do what the best when you have a game plan. And I tell everyone, hard work today makes tomorrow easy. Uh, and 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 you clearly, uh, you know, you're protected. You're, you're, Abby, I mentioned you, you should be. You're going to call your protected thrombolysis. I'm going to start stealing your, your your. I'm going to. I'm going to. I'm going to quote you. This is a great uh, a, a great technique, right. especially in those rare cases. Yeah, protected thrombectomy is what we're going to call it. And protected on PTE. I like it. Yeah, exactly. All right, man. Thank you for coming. I appreciate All right, buddy. It. All right, thank you guys.